Yo, it's shaking everybody. We're back. It's the Orange Bloods team for the Orange Bloods Modcast brought to you by MyPerfectFranchise.net. Let Stop working for the, the man. You become the man. Let our guy Andy uh, show you the way. 404-973-9901. That's the information right there. Let Andy help you start your own business, start your own franchise, and start living the dream. Fellas, a lot of, get to, a lot of stuff to get to today on what should be like a boring may but we've got the jordan addison decision we've got sarkeesian in houston yesterday i thought with a number of newsy little things we've got texas offering a juco linebacker and i think serenity is scheduled to interview him for a video that'll be up on this channel the orange bloods texas football channel literally uh before the morning is over so a lot of stuff to get to do us a solid uh, as you file into the chat and start uh, making us laugh and all of those things. Uh, like the channel, subscribe to the channel, help us get the 12,000 as soon as possible. And uh, by all means, engage. Fellas, let's just start with Jordan Addison. We're waiting for a visit, or excuse me, we're waiting for a decision at this point from the Pittsburgh All American. It is down to Texas and USC. And I think earlier this week, I thought Texas was gaining some momentum in this on war. I think even as recent as yesterday, I started, I think, for the first time to really start thinking to myself, is this going to happen? And then today we arrive and it feels a little bit less sure. I think we're anticipating a decision in the next 24 to 48 hours, maybe even at the latest. We'll just go around the room. Everybody's thoughts on this Jordan Addison thing as it's unfolded and kind of where we are as of today. I mean, you know, my perspective is I always viewed, you know, Jordan Addison as a bonus. I've never viewed him as the absolute necessity of what needed to occur. So, um, you know, if at the end of the day he, he, he chooses USC, you know, I don't look at it and say, oh, my God, like, what the hell do they do now? I still think there's a lot of other good – so, you know, good weapons that are on this team, still a lot of good additions. Like, you know, everyone was still hype about Xavier Worthy, you know, Jai Hall and Isaiah Nair, Jordan Whittington. Like, all those guys still remain. You know, you still got Bijan, you still got Roshan, you still got Keelan. So um, even if it trends in the, a direction that doesn't favor Texas, you know, it would be a loss, but I don't necessarily view it as a huge loss. And Jason, what about you? Uh, yeah, I kind of echo what Anwar said. I mean, if you're Texas, hey, it's great to have him. The Blitnikoff winner, the best receiver in the country. Obviously, it's great to have him. First round draft pick, probably. But I don't know that it's necessarily a setback if Texas doesn't get him. Um, you know, I'm, I've kind of just been watching the story from a distance catch. You've had such great coverage of it. I'm just almost like most people watching this mod cast, just kind of sitting there just waiting for an answer at this point. It feels to me like uh, and again, maybe you you have more intel than I do, but it, if USC doesn't get him, it almost feels like USC messed it up in a, in a way, right? And, and that pushed him to Texas a little bit. But, uh, you know, it'd be great for Texas to get him, celebrate him, Texas fans, if Texas gets him. But I wouldn't cry over uh, spilled milk if Texas doesn't get him. But at this point, I'm just, like you said, maybe the next 48 hours, just kind of anxiously awaiting an answer to see how this uh, how this story ends. Alex, I kind of differ from the, these two guys. Like, I look at Addison, and unlike an O'Shawn Mathis, where I wouldn't exactly know how to handicap where he ranks in the, the talent ladder on the roster, I don't know how much of an NFL prospect he really is. Um, I don't. I think he'd be the best player on the Texas defense, but I can't definitively say that. I feel like if you add Jordan Addison, you're talking about adding – either the second or third best player on your team. And considering he was the nation's best wide receiver a year ago, you could make the case that if you add Jordan Addison, you've added a guy who's your best player suddenly. I kind of want to cry over spilled milk if there's any milk spilled. Are you with me or are you with these two? Is that crying over spilled milk? Is that the old term? I the old term the, the old term that comes to my mind is found money right it's uh it's kind of it's and so that's why i kind of i kind of find myself in a lot of ways i mean i understand your point catch them 
at, at what point does like the found money you start thinking it's like oh well this really could be this really could be 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 my money you start thinking about how you would spend it and the ranch you would go buy on the hill country and stuff but it's still it's still just found money you know and, and that's how it's always felt with jordan addison to me clearly he'd be, he'd be awesome to bring on but um man i feel like we've gotten more run, like at just us at orange bloods so i feel like we've gotten two good weeks of run out of this story and you know credit to you catch for kind of you know really bird dogging this thing out and sort of bring it into the public and you know we've we've covered it how we can and and it's been it's honestly like i was telling you guys on slack it's been a longer sort of news cycle here with jordan addison than i would have ever imagined i feel like texas is probably in a better spot than they would have imagined at this point you just kind of kind of let things roll found money house money maybe it comes to you but um it's like you know it's like on war and jason said it it to, to me, it's always felt like a little bit of a of a long shot. All right, look, uh, it's funny. Anwar just sent me a message in chat, and it was I, Anwar. We're we're on we're literally on the same page because <laughs> I'm, I'm, everybody's got their Jordan Addison thoughts on the table, and right. I don't know where to go with that other than we're waiting for a decision. So here's what we'll do: like we're going to be going for the next hour maybe a little bit longer than that, knowing us. We'll keep you updated on Jordan Addison. We'll certainly circle back to Jordan Addison. However, <laughs> the thing that everybody wants to talk about are the comments that Nick Saban made yesterday regarding Texas A&M's recruiting class, the specificity of which he made a point to say that A&M paid all their players and that, you know, it's – it kind of breaks like the rule in college football recruiting, Jason, to name names, to to get specific, that it came from Saban, a guy that you and I could look at his roster and go, well, when we were covering that recruitment, we were told that it was about money. And when we were following that guy's recruitment, we were told that it was about money. It's awfully strange that a guy that has the most five stars on his roster of any school in the country is the one banging the pot the loudest about what Texas A&M did in its most recent recruiting class. I almost don't even know how to respond to it all, Jason, other than to be like, I can't believe of all of the people who would be naming names and pointing fingers that it would be Saban first and foremost. Yeah. And we're not talking about, you can look at the Alabama roster from 10 years ago, 10 now. years ago. We're talking about the roster right now. Guys, <laughs> guys that Texas recruited that wound up at Alabama. You're like, okay, that dude got paid. That dude got paid. Um, I'm not going to name names because I'm not going to open myself up for a lawsuit. But, I mean, for Nick Saban to be the one – I have so many thoughts on this. I mean, listen, we can talk for an hour and a half or longer just on this. But for Saban to be the one bitching and moaning – and it's funny, I saw Billy Lucci actually say, like, he comes across as a whiny bitch. Well, he does. Nick Saban is coming across as a whiny bitch in this situation. But I guarantee it, for Nick Saban, it's all calculated. He knows exactly what he's doing. I don't know what his motive is. Maybe it's just to get some changes made, or if it's to make a look bad, probably. But I guarantee it's a calculated move by Nick Saban, just like it was last summer when he said, hey, my quarterback's got a million dollars in NIL money. And we all kind of were like, oh, bullshit. No, he doesn't. And probably probably Bryce Young did have a million dollars now. Now That might have been a low bar. Um, every move he makes, every statement he makes is calculated. So there's a reason for that. Now, I'm, I didn't even know this, but people are saying in the chat that uh, Jimbo has a 10 a.m. press conference. I almost want to log off this modcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Press conference. So, um, you know, it's it's so just rich in irony. Um, I don't know where this is going to go next. We may know in 13 minutes where this is going to go next. But for, for Nick Saban to be the one making that statement is almost comical. But I promise you it's a calculated move by Nick Saban for some answer he wants to get or some change he wants made. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, it, I promise you it was a calculated move. He wants, he Jason. wants power back, Jason. Like that's, it, the, that's exactly, what the probably. move is. He has lost power because it was Alabama gets to get the guys that they want. 
and everybody gets the leftovers. And now what he's having guys do and approaching him and these recruits, these recruits aren't talking about, oh, well, three or four years from now, if I play the game here at Alabama, maybe I can come and draft pick. They're like, hey, man, where, where is my stuff right now? Mm-hmm. Right now, Nick. And so <laughs> Nick is used to having the power. And, and people people who have power don't like to lose power, Jason. Like, no one, like, willingly decides, I want to give up their, my power. Mm-hmm. That's how it that, – right? you, you don't see dictators – step down, they usually get overthrown, right? Because no one likes to give up their power. That's all this shit is. And, you know, of all, you know, calling out AM was weak sauce. Calling out Jackson State was even weaker. Mm-hmm. Like, first of all, if you're Dion, you're just minding your own business, right? You're just sitting there, chilling on the couch, just, just, you're just, just having a damn good, good old time. And all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, whoa, you, who called for me? Who, this, that, that, we just did a damn commercial last year. We're doing Aflac. <laughs> and now oh, you you just called me out. So that's why Dion's like, okay, that's cool. I got some smoke for you coming today. You gotta have Jimbo say, I got some smoke coming for you. It is such, it is just it is. I I Nick Saban, if all the people, he ain't the one for that. Like, if you want to have somebody else say it, somebody else should, but he, he just can't stand seeing that what he used to be able to go into living rooms. And just say, you want to come to Bama, right? And everyone would say, oh, my God, yes. And then allegations of guys getting a little bit of money. And by the way, there would be maybe a handful of guys that you hear about that would get paid. He's got to pay like 25, 30, 40. Like, there's a lot more that it's got, that have to get paid right now. He don't like not having the power. It's almost on war like he wants the NCAA or whoever to come in and just regulate things, right? Because then he can still – go above whatever regulation they put in but right it's just it's just so comical to hear him just play the high and mighty card about we did it the right way nick you haven't done it the right way since you're not even when you're back at lsu and i always say this nick saban isn't nick saban without recruiting elite players i mean you know he will he will fall off his throne quickly if he doesn't have a bigger a big talent advantage over every team he plays um yeah it's almost like by putting this out there, he he wants the NCAA to come in and say, okay, we're going to regulate this. We're going to cap it where it's it's all the same for everybody in terms of what we know is out there in, in the public eye. It's all the same for everybody. That way he can go above and beyond behind the scenes to still, as you said, kind of control that uh, or ha- have that dominance in, in terms of recruiting players. But uh, I don't know, man, fun story to talk about. I'm, I'm curious to hear Ketch and, and Alex's take. And I'm, Alex I'm, looks I'm, like he's ready to jump in. I might well, have just, to mute yeah. my mic so I can live stream Jimbo's press conference. Here. We've been multitasking <laughs> all morning. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, I'll just hop in and say, man, I think that this really goes – I agree with all the points you guys have made about saving of all the people in the world to c- come up with this sort of nonsense. Imagine – um, just just imagine it being Nick Saban going and crying foul about somebody else doing something and recruiting to where, I mean, just talk about sour grapes. And you know what? Talk about a fraud. What a fucking fraud this guy is. Because here's the thing. He's at, he's at, he's at Alabama, okay? Are you telling me these, these, these Alabama guys don't have money? They've been giving these guys money for years and years and years. It used to be a lot easier. It used to be all under the radar. Used to, now that things are out in the open and now that the books are wide open, you know, it isn't like Saban doesn't have the money like to just do this thing legally, right? All he needs to do is shift these boosters that used to was I know it's not the Yellowwood guy, that's the Auburn guy, but they got a million of these dudes in Alabama, right? It isn't just tech, it's not just Texas oil money. There's rich alumni that want to throw their money around all over the United States and, and, and all these different programs, especially Alabama. And so you take Nick Saban, who's built his program on what he calls accountability, what he calls hard work, what he calls going to the next level, working harder than the other guy. It's like, all right, look, dickhead, these are the new rules. Now you go work harder. You figure out how to make it work on a level playing field as opposed to as as, as opposed to just saying, you know what, I'm going to do this shit all under the table. The books are closed. But no one's going to know what's happening. I'm going to pay these guys all off. Now the now now the playing field has been leveled. And what do you do? You shirk into the press and you cry like a little bitch because now you have to work a little bit harder. Whenever all you do is tell these young men that they're going to get ahead in their life by working hard and by taking accountability and making sure that they play within the rules and, and, and that they do the right things to make themselves better men. What kind of what kind of what kind of fraud is this guy? 
I mean, it, not only is he a whine, not only is he just so whiny, but he's a fraud with everything he's, he's trying to teach these guys. Everything he's trying to instill within the culture, the culture of that program, is a complete lie because he can outwork the other coaches right now. He's decided he doesn't want to because it's easier the old way, the sleazy way, the slimy way. I well, um, as a guy who gets paid, uh, he had, it was the extension was eighty four point eight million dollars, and he's complaining about a couple of things. The only difference is Alex. There's a difference when you got to pay six, seven guys, maybe eight guys under the table, and you've got an entire roster full of guys that want money. Cry me a, cry me a damn river, so oh. right. Real quick, I think what's really interesting about where Saban went with this is that, and and look, Jason can certainly speak to this too. What we'd heard, what, what's been said about AM behind the scenes isn't that they're using NIL to cheat the system. It's been that they've essentially, and I, I have no proof of this, right? So let me let me just say that from the beginning. But if we're going to have the conversation, I feel like we, we have to acknowledge the elephants in the room. The allegations that live in, in the shadows about Texas A&M and the recruiting class that they had right now wasn't that they signed all these dudes to NIL deals. It was that, they paid these guys more money than Alabama was going to offer them. That you know, whereas Alabama was like a two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollar type arrangement, that A and M was going beyond that, and that they were paying guys a half million dollars, that they were getting paid in crypto, and that you know, that's where the conversation was. What I've actually heard about A and M is that from an actual NIL standpoint, they're not ahead of anybody. I mean, as I've heard that AM's NIL people have been trying to follow closely what Texas's NIL people have been doing because in terms of getting all this stuff legally set up in the best way possible, it's still hurting cats right now. I mean, even Texas isn't fully operational the way that it would like to be in the world of NIL. Hence, there's a pancake factory, but there's no factory for any of the other positions. It's not as easy as this thing has been set up, uh, I think has been portrayed, so that Saban went in and blamed this on NIL instead of just saying, well, AM cheated and signed a bunch of guys and paid them all is really interesting. It, it almost looks like he's using NIL as his way of diming Texas AM out, but the whole thing about AM from the very beginning was that they were just doing what Alabama has been doing, but even better. And that is the great irony in all of this, because if Nick Saban wants to have a conversation about players getting paid under the table, I'll reference something that Travis Johnson, former Houston Texan, uh, former Florida State All-American, who laughed and joked that while he was a high school prospect, Alabama offered him money and that the Saban is just mad because the old way used to be like leave a suitcase full of money on a doorstep. And then, Oh, Hey, look what I found when I opened the door this morning. The suggestion now is that all of this is happening a little bit more in the light of day because of NIL and you don't have to put money in suitcases and just leave them. But again, it's, it's wild. If this was, Mike Gundy, Anwar, I'd get it, right? Sure. It'd be like, I already didn't have a chance in recruiting. I'm not getting four and five star guys. And now, you know, now I have no chance because now this is happening. Although he would have had T Boone Pickens back in the day. So maybe they would have had a fighting chance. But then it's Alabama and Nick Saban. It just makes us all feel like we're living in a bizarro world right now that of all of the guys that would make us stink about this, it would be a guy who himself has been alleged to be paying players under the table for decades. I mean, and it just it opens him up. Like you've got all these former recruits. Sorry to interrupt, Omar, but no. someone just posted like all these former recruits are coming out saying, hey, they offered me six figures three years ago, Alabama did. So, I mean, he opened himself up. For, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to 
draw a spotlight on on Alabama's cheating. So uh the thing the thing that you never do catch in any industry, any business, any walk of life, you don't piss off the people who know where the bodies are buried. No, oh, yeah. And, and that and what Nick Saban has done, he's gonna piss off people, especially a guy like Jimbo, who knows where the bodies are buried. And at that point, like I said, I, I'm with Jason. I would love to log off and just sign back on at 11 <laughs> and continue this. this is, um, you're gonna you, you're gonna piss off the wrong person. And you know, hell, there was a guy uh, catch even yesterday um, one of the, on one of the tweets that mentioned something about how he he got offered a, a paid money. Hold on, I uh, hell, I liked uh, one of it, so I could I always like stuff on Twitter so I can remember it for later. Um, so people, some people are like, God damn, I likes everything. It's actually just more of a face <laughs> note. It's, uh, this some guy named Travis Johnson. It said, y'all been paying players since the eighties offered me six figures in 99 slash 2000 and gave Albert means and his coaches six figures during that time. And now y'all swear y'all not paying anyone like kids say cap y'all was NIL before NIL. Hey, can I tell you a Travis Johnson story? Yeah. Because I went to Hawaii with Travis Johnson in January of 2000 for the Hula Bowl. Rivals took their All-America team that year to Hawaii. And it's funny that Travis Johnson is – I was going to tell one of the stories of that I, I, I tell pretty often. Uh, but that Travis Johnson chimed in is funny because he was with me when we did this visit. As a matter of fact, Travis and I – uh, follow each other on Twitter. I gave him some photos of this trip that I'm talking about. But on the day of the Hula Bowl, and I feel bad for bringing up a name here because the guy that I'm going to bring up passed away. So he's not here to defend himself in any shape, form, or fashion. But it, I can't not tell the story. So it's the Hula Bowl, and they're doing all of these uh, media day things for the high school players. Back then, the recruiting scene wasn't quite like it is today. A lot of these guys had never done interviews before, before they went to the hula bowl. So they were trying to teach them how to do who interviews. And they had press conferences and stuff set up for each of these kids. And I'm sitting around hanging out with these all American players and Charles Rogers, who ended up being an all American at Michigan state and a first round draft pick of the Detroit lions back in that stretch where they were taking a wide receiver every five minutes in the first round. Charles Rogers is talking to a guy named Naughton McKay Losher, who is from Canada. And McKay Losher, of, this is so ironic, he was committed to Alabama. And Charles Rogers is committed to Michigan State. Guess who the head coach of Michigan State was at the time? Nick Saban. Rogers is trying to recruit Naughton McKay Losher to join him at Michigan State. And and if anybody has any doubts about this story, go find not McKay Losher, wherever the hell he is. I'd, I'd love to hear his perspective on the story I'm about to tell. So Charles Rogers is telling him, you know, you can get paid. You can get paid a lot of money. And he tells him, let me put you on the phone with a coach at Michigan State. And not McKay Losher ends up taking a phone call right in front of me with a coach from Michigan State where they essentially – have a discussion about like, yeah, I'll, I want to hear your pitch. And Charles Rogers is telling him about like, this is what you need to hook him up with. And like the next week, not McKay Losher takes an official visit to Michigan State, despite being committed to Alabama. He ended up sticking with Alabama. But the whole thing is funny because way back in the day, before Nick Saban was at Alabama, he was at Michigan State. And he had players at Michigan State trying to recruit other players from Alabama because of the things that he believed a Nick Saban-led program would be able to offer a kid, ironically enough, in terms of getting you know benefits from behind the scenes. So that Travis Johnson is the one that kind of came out this morning to talk about how he was offered – like $100,000 or whatever it was, was kind of funny because he ironically was on the same trip that I was on and might have been sitting five or ten feet away from this conversation between Charles Rogers and not McKay Losher when it happened 22 years ago. It's an incredibly small world. 
<laughs> I mean, for real. <laughs> so it just goes to show you it's been going on for two decades, more than two decades. Well, you go back four decades, and Eric Dickerson was getting trans ams from both SMU and oh, Texas man. A&M <laughs> and not giving any of them back because what are they going to do, complain that they're – Illegal hush money <laughs> was yeah. not given back by them. Just so you know, I am. We are keeping an eye on the Jimbo Fisher press conference. It has not started yet, even though it's ten oh three. I wonder is Jimbo going to go wild on this? I don't know. It's, it's oh, one of these deals. Wherever I, I mean, I'm not used to because the last the last two coaches we've had to go over at Texas. They are lickety split right up there, man. Charlie would sometimes be a little bit late like this, a few minutes late. Herman, never. And Sark, I mean, Anwar, have you seen Sark be a, even a minute? Sark seems to want to get there even before it even starts. And just nah, Sark, out there. Sark, Sark, on Mondays, he's he's always on time. You know, throughout the week, he's usually late. So. Fisher warned every – this is not the first time in this offseason that a and and Alabama have had a little bit of a – a riff because when Saban did this before a few months ago, Jimbo Fisher best basically threatened to name names. He's like, if you really want to do this, we can do this. And we'll just talk about it out in the open about all of the stuff that I know and have seen over the years. It feels like this press conference has been called Specifically, well, I was going to ask you guys, rebuttal. like, what is what is, is it? They didn't just have a spring game or something. No. They, like, what do they even? This is, is a, for? Jimbo has is meeting the media to specifically respond to the accusations made by Nick Saban yesterday. Yeah, he ain't just, talking about the NFL Jimbo draft. Jimbo doesn't. Jimbo <laughs> doesn't give an f, and Jimbo's not bowing down to anyone. Like he ain't scared. He don't, <laughs> he, he, he don't feel like he's got to kiss nobody's ring. He don't feel yeah. like that Nick Saban's all that. Hell, he's like, we just beat your damn team last year, and we're, gonna, we're beating you in recruiting. We're on the come up, like, and you're going to call me out? Like, that's the thing. Again, when guys are sitting there minding their own business, and you call them out that, hey, guys, you're going you're gonna to respond. You call on the guys. You got to expect that they're going to respond. Well, and the thing is, Saban didn't mention anybody else. He just called out Texas uh -oh. A&M. Oh, I think we got some action down here, Catch. All right, well, we will be Mystery Science 3000-esque. Real quick, while while Jimbo gets started and we wait to see what the first fireworks from Jimbo's press <laughs> like conference are going to be. a space shuttle launch or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, real quick, what, update everybody on the Jai Hall. Boy, Alan Cannon. Okay, sorry, man. Onward, update everybody on a Jai Hall real quick because – it, I've seen that question asked a few times in the chat. And if people aren't on orangebloods.com, this is why you get on orangebloods.com. Like Nate's takes is asking right now about Ajay Hall. While we wait for this to kind of unfold, give us the Ajay Hall update real quick. Well, first of all, Sab uh, Jimbo's talking right now. It's well, we can't break it. how despicable it was. He's saying that the family... He's saying you're accusing 17-year-old kids of breaking state laws, all this stuff like this. <laughs> just, we need to switch over to a live broadcast yeah. of, uh, of what? It's like our reaction videos, like the twins. I mean, are we allowed for just a moment to take a second and see? No rules were broken, he just said. And these families, it's despicable that a rebel head coach can come out and say this when he doesn't get his way or things don't go his way. Doesn't allow those <laughs> to happen. It's ridiculous. The narcissist in him. <laughs> Boy, the SEC is going to be fun. Oh, Texas my goodness. Gets there. Go talk to the coaches who coach for Saban, he said. He's calling him a narcissist. Some people think they're God. <laughs> Seventeen-year-old kids and their families. It's amazing. Some people think they're God. Don't dig into how God did his his deal. <laughs> 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 
Go dig into his past. Oh, man. You know, good for Jimbo, man. Dude, he came out more fiery than I thought. He came out with more steam than I would have thought. I mean, he he told people after signing day, if you want to do this, we can do this. Careful. I think it's hysterical that we're in a world where SEC coaches are imploding over each other about a level of cheating that they made mainstream. I mean, one of the reasons why Texas for so long turned its nose up at the SEC was the idea that they were cheaters and Texas wanted to do it in a non-cheating way. Where is that that A&M Alabama game this year is in Tuscaloosa? God, no offense to Alabama, Texas, but Alabama, Texas A&M just became the game of the year in college football. Wow. God, can we play that game week one? <laughs> like move that game up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I mean, he's basically just okay. flat out saying, "Hey, Saban cheats his ass off." Good for so, him. You again? What did I, I just agree, say? Omar, you don't. You him. don't piss off someone who knows where the bodies are buried. Jimbo just said that he's not taking his calls anymore. That they're done. Yeah. There's a lot of history there. I mean, you know, that goes that goes back a long ways. The, the, I guess the question I have now is what does the rest of the SEC do? Do they do, do they pick a side? Because it feels like non like Travis Johnson went to Florida State. So obviously there's a Jimbo connection there with him when he starts talking about how much money he was offered by Alabama when he was a recruit. But that predates Jimbo and Saban at Alabama, quite frankly. I just wonder how the this these are two SEC West, arguably the top two contenders in the SEC West this year, and they're throwing grenades at each other right now. And we're not even into the offseason. We're not even in the summertime yet. Imagine what SEC media days is going to look like. (laughs) Yes. I mean, where they're both after get questioned about stuff. We know Jimbo is not going to (laughs) be. Jimbo Fisher on save, and he's the greatest ever, huh? When you've got all the advantages, it's easy. Like, talk that way about Nick Saban. And now it's out there. And yeah, I man. wonder if this is the thing that makes Saban retire. The beginning Seriously, the I end. thought that too, Catch. Seriously, does this does this he, cool his like, man, I'm a coach of I'm a coach of a different era. You know, things are changing. The damn kids, if they wouldn't have got away with it. Or what's that thing that they used to say on Scooby Doo? Scooby Doo. Would have yeah. got gotten away with it if it wasn't for you darn kids. <laughs> if it weren't for you darn Aggies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just it's fascinating to me because I think back 40 plus years ago, almost 50 years ago, when DKR retired. I mean, the talk back then was that DKR retired because Oklahoma was cheating in football, and like DKR didn't have the stomach to engage in the direction that high school football recruiting was going. It's always been the talk of why Royal retired from Texas in the first place was that just the direction of the sport was just, he could, he wasn't going to do it. He couldn't do it. Couldn't live in an age where he's having to compete against Oklahoma and Oklahoma was treating the rules differently than he was. Saban's been breaking the rules for decades, but now like Anwar said at the very beginning, he can't break the rules and have complete control. Now, even schools like Texas are like, okay, well, now there's a legal way to pay players. Now we'll engage. Now we'll do these things that we never did before because there's a legal path to do so. And I think this is going to create a distraction, Jason, all season long for Saban, a guy that hates distractions. This story, I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't feel like this is the type of story that's going to, I think it's going to simmer for months. It's going to simmer going into SEC media day. 
it's going to get legs every time somebody like Travis Johnson Mm -hmm. wants to respond and say how they were offered money by Alabama or whomever back when they were prospects, SEC media days. Then the the season starts, and when that game looms, the story comes back again. I mean, without knowing anything else, I if I was in Vegas, I might put a hundred dollars on whatever odds exist that this will be Nick Saban's last season. Maybe, man. This, you know, it's like every story. This story will die down over the weekend, probably, but it, it's going to simmer back up in a big way come August or whatever. And I don't know when they play each other, A and M and Alabama, but. Oh my goodness, that that is the game of the year without question. Uh, I don't care what their records are or anything else at this point. But I mean, Omar, you need to be at SEC Media Days, not to Big Twelve. Yeah, I mean, not Big Twelve. I mean, again, and this, I think, I think we're Saban really uh, miscalculated. We probably don't need the feed anymore. But but, but, but you know, what Saban miscalculated is, I think he thought people would be sympathetic to him. And he re- and he's quickly realizing, like it, it's like the Yankees complaining about another team spending in baseball. Yeah, and it's like, wait, 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 what? But almost complaining to a different degree. Like no one is gonna, no one's sympathetic towards Alabama. Like he, you've got to understand, you've been on top. Everyone's kind of turned a blind eye to how you got there. He, and he really thought people were like, yeah, this NIL thing is really messed up. And people are like, you. You nah, man. So he he does a huge miscalculation. I don't know if it would be his last uh, time, but I can tell you it's the beginning of the end. Uh, as far as as far as him being on top, as far as him being untouchable, as far as him being that guy that you know everyone kisses the ring to. Jimbo's basically spit on that ring. And Dion, when Dion comes on later, oh, oh, oh. you talk about prime that's time. That's his ass, like buddy. Yeah, they, he's gonna stick that duck up his ass. Is what he's gonna do. Like Dion is not the one. Dion, I can't believe Dion, he threw Dion. Dion That's a, the there's guy no boys. Catch Dion slapped the guy who worked for his school. All right, like <laughs> Dion ain't that guy to 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 mess with. Like he is not that dude. People are gonna find out real quick what Dion is gonna get. Is gonna get good. Okay, so you asked me. You 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 want to? You asked me about the Jail Hall. You want me to address that? Yeah, do that real quick. We can always come back. This this isn't going anywhere. So the uh, the Jai Hall thing is if you to, to, what Ketch was trying to say as far as uh, you know early if you were on Orange Bloods, I had it on there a couple of days ago. Jai Hall is just trolling. He was just having a good old time. He took some stuff down a couple of weeks ago, and he understands that for whatever reason. Speaking of Bama. Bama, Bama fans, Bama media members follow everything that he does. And so why am I hearing myself with an echo? I don't hear an echo. I, I'm like literally hearing myself. Yeah, I've been muted. I don't know. Jimbo's finished, by the way. but I don't know if he's finished or whether that just thing just kind of cut off. It seemed like he was nah, in the He middle. got up and walked off. He so. finished. Yeah. Okay. He just brought out his flamethrower and then quite a bit in those five minutes. So I want to go back. I'm going to go back and rewatch it. But uh, yeah. I'm going to watch it as soon as we get done, so I can skip the whole thing. So Jai Hall was just trolling. He knows Bama fans and, and media members always stalk everything that he does, and so he literally did it as a joke to mess around with Bama and the media stuff, and everyone fell for it. Now Texas fans fell for it as well, but and overreacted to it. But this goes back to when you start trying to get into the minds of 18 year olds and 19 year olds and what they post and what they don't post and overreact. He took his stuff down. And and it was like, well, he took it down a few weeks ago. And John was just messing with people. It worked. Um, he got into under people's skin and, you know, he will be here when, when it's time to report. That's all that thing is. Uh, and I know people asked about like the Gabriel Floyd, the Gabriel Floyd, interesting enough. I was just talking to him last week. And the Gabriel Floyd has actually been playing in these like one-on-one series. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this thing online. It's really a genius uh, kind of league. They, they they had a big thing out in Vegas where you got a quarterback, and even Michael Vick was throwing to these guys. Um, but he basically – uh, you go one offense. It's like offense versus defense, like seven on seven. And I think they play for money. It's like twenty five thousand or something to that effect. Ends up being a winner. And like the Gabriel got to like the top three guys. He had won the Vegas 
torn. Uh, well, listen, what do they do? Do they guard? Or they just one on one? Yes. So yeah, one on one, you get a certain amount of times, and you, it's a receiver versus a DB. So you okay. can either sign up on the DB side or the receiver side, and after a certain amount of times, it gets breakups, whatever. You keep advancing to next levels, next rounds. It's really entertaining. I gotta admit, I started watching it. It really and it, it, and as I watched it, at some point, someone said the Gabriel Floyd. And I was like the Gabriel Floyd. And, and so eventually I saw he was like one of the top three guys and they didn't have enough DB. So he had a, he was playing offense and defense. So it looks like what people are saying he's gotten cleared. And uh, so he has been playing some sort of football. But, you know, the, you got to just always remember that was a Tom Herman recruit. That's not a Starkeesian recruit. So, you know, I'm not quite sure that the loyalty still remains there. Dude, like someone asked, yeah, people keep asking about him. I, this is kind of news to me i mean he is cleared he's going to play at college of the canyons uh which is out in california you know he was a 2019 recruit for texas gabe floyd was tied in with brew mccoy listen i mean gabe was my dude man in, in that class he was the guy that when i needed an interview i'd call gabe floyd because he'd always pick up and he was always a great interview and he always had the insight on everybody else um interestingly i last saw gabe about a I guess it was two years ago. I met my daughter's middle school track meet in Leander, Texas. And I see Gabe, Gabriel Floyd walking down the stands. I'm like, Gabe, what's up? And we chatted for a while and uh, his little brother was running in the same track meet, but man, good for him. Hope it works out for him. I mean, I always loved covering the Gabriel Floyd as a recruit. I don't know. I mean, listen, I'll touch base with him and I'll keep tabs on him if something heats up with Texas. But like Almar said, that was a Tom Herman recruit. That was what, I mean, if he's clear, to, yeah, but uh, if he stayed hey, in shape, these linebackers, right? Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> if he stayed in shape, man, do you, do you remember to Gabriel Floyd as a as a prospect? I mean, oh, I, of course, yeah. I mean, he clearly, personal I mean, the video has been true. I mean, on Slack, oh, okay, three, just three years. On Slack and you'll, you'll see he's still in tremendous shape. Go yeah, to the he was doing some personal time. training stuff, so I'm assuming he's in great shape. Um. You know, hey, man, Sark's a West Coast guy. Maybe Texas makes a run. I mean, you see how he does it. College of the Canyons first, but maybe Texas makes a run. at the Gabriel Floyd loves, loved, I can't say currently, but certainly when he was being recruited, even after his playing days were what we thought were over forever, he loved the University of Texas. So, you know, if he's a viable prospect, Texas would be stupid not to try to get him back. At least, at least kick the tires, kind of just see what's going on, see if he's in shape. Yeah. See if he's in some shape. I mean, hey, what, what, I hope so, cause give me somebody to interview. What was it? A neck? It was a neck. Spinal, right? a narrow spinal, spinal, narrow spinal cord. They discovered after he signed him. He competed in the army, or back then it was the Army All American Bowl. Did all that stuff. He was set to enroll, and they noted. I forget the medical terminology. We had narrowing of the spinal stenosis. Cord. Stenosis. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Hey, Alex, real quick, Diamante Tucker Dorsey. Well, um, in watching a little bit of him, he's a small guy. I mean, there's no question that he's a hell of a player for James Madison, right? I mean, the production kind of speaks for itself. And James Madison, at their level, is one of the better college football programs in the country. It feels like they're always in the playoffs making a run for national championships at that level. What would you think when you watched him play a little bit? Yeah, I watched back. Um, I watched back the Montana game. I guess the FCS championship quarterfinal last year versus Montana. I also watched some of the game versus North Dakota State, uh, but the Montana game was the one I watched all the way through. And look, I mean, the first thing you notice when you watch him, he's a little. You know, he's 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 undersized. There's no getting around it. He's what five five ten, two hundred fourteen pounds. You wonder exactly how he's going to fit on the Texas defense, but you just watch him. And, you, you know, you, you got to factor in level of competition, but they play him everywhere, man. They play. I mean, he's a he's he's a star weak side will linebacker for these guys. But he has a lot to his skill set that kind of makes you think about a Mike linebacker, the way that he calls in the plays, the way that sometimes he, re he really is just right in the middle of the defense. He can come downhill. He could pop these guys. I said that he reminds me because he's, he's he's so stout and thick. Right. I said he reminds me of. Do you guys re remember Ram Man from the um, from the Masters of the Universe cartoons? Of course. Like, yeah, like how he kind of just like he's like his body's spring loaded. He gets up into these guys' chin straps like Ram Man or something coming downhill. But it's just, it's the sideline to sideline speed, and you see him um, in there with his middle linebacker number seven, 
which I can't think of his name off the top of my head. It's uh, Kevin something. Kevin as I can't think of his name, but you, you just you look at the you look at the sideline to sideline speed comparatively versus versus him. And you just say he, he's he's running at a different level. He's playing at a different level than these guys. I mean, this guy's a he's a FCS All American. I mean, just look. I mean, last year, 116 tackles, nine TFLs, two and a half sacks, two forced fumbles, one fumble recovery, four interceptions. I think two of those had were for pick sixes. He had four pass breakups, six quarterback hurries. I mean, he was he was everywhere. Right. The only question is, it's like okay, if he were to come to Texas. Five foot ten, two hundred fourteen pounds. He would be Texas' smallest linebacker by far, if we're not counting the true freshman. Because I believe that Travell Johnson would be smart, would be smaller. But I mean, he's he's smaller than even like a Derek Brown or somebody like this. But he's a guy who's good at football, uh, extremely good at the game. Um, it's just, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from you guys. It's like. At the linebacker position, is the is the linebacker recruiting the linebacker transfer market right now? Is that for help this year? Is that for help moving into the future? Because we know you know next year, Demarion Overshone's going gone. Luke Brockemeyer hasn't been good, but he's gone. Jed Bush hasn't been gone, but he's good. Then or hasn't been good, but he's gone. And then next year, what is Bendo will be a senior? Devin Richardson will be a senior. That leaves only Jalen Ford, who'll be a junior coming into the twenty twenty four season. I mean, they need to start filling up the pipeline here at linebacker a graduate transfer doesn't do that so the question is all right is he ready to play now and where does he fit and do you guys think he could play mike i mean i don't it it, it isn't like texas is mike line and i wrote about this it isn't like texas is mike linebackers are just this different level of size of guy than their will linebackers so uh when you look at them all together so uh, if you look at the wills um to marvion overshone 6'4, 221 Devin Richardson, 6'3", 235. David Bend is listed as 6'0", 233. Then you have the two true freshmen who wouldn't even – Travell Johnson, Derek Brown. Derek Brown could play edge. Travell Johnson could play nickel with his size. We don't even know. They've talked to Travell about playing in a similar role to – who's the kid that moved to – Maurice Blackwell, uh, playing some safety. So so, so some safety, right. And then – uh, but you know Maurice Blackwell, a really good situational kind of passing down linebacker last year at, as as well. So, um, but and then at Mike, so you, at Mike Jalen Ford is six two two thirty four. Luke Brockermeyer listed as six three two twenty. Jed Bush is listed at six two two thirty six. So it's not like there's that much. Of, you're talking about guys who are two thirty five, two thirty three, and two twenty one versus guys who are two thirty four, two thirty six, and two twenty. These guys are kind of the same weight. It, I don't think. It takes too much to just really squint and say, I mean, could he? This guy come in and push Jalen Ford? Well, if he comes in and he looks a lot, you know, it's like, do you remember watching Devin Richardson? Even when we watched him, you watch him versus Ole Miss, you watch him versus Alabama when he played for New Mexico State. Um, he didn't look as small as he was whenever he came into Texas. Sometimes when these guys get on the Texas football field, they look smaller than they do on their tape. And a guy like Diamante, he's he's already maxed out. Right, he's not going to get any bigger. At the, like, he's already filled out. He's already real stout. He br- like he brings a wall up, but he's not going to really fill out anymore. Um, do, I wonder if I mean, is that a guy Alex, that can push Jalen Ford? Alex, I think the thing to remember is that I think they hate their depth and they have questions about their starters, and it's like walking into a bar at one forty-five in the morning, and you and you want to hook up with somebody. Like beggars can't be choosy at 1.45 in the morning. And I think this kid is a grad transfer that put his name in the portal. Any team that needs linebacker help at this point. Yeah, I get Florida it. State offered right away. Ole Miss offered right away. Oh, I think these schools I, at I this point that. are just willing to take – if they're under the 85, I think they're willing to take a chance that this guy can come in and fit somehow, some way. But I don't think there's a plan with this guy. I don't think they've had enough time to, to like – well, we can make some sub packages, and because he has a Maurice Blackwell kind of body. Yeah, well, no, because he's Maurice Blackwell is a little. Maurice, Maurice Blackwell's taller and he's longer, and so like the, I think you're looking this at guy, the athleticism, this, man. I mean, uh, he's this guy is fast, he's quick, but he's squatty. He's stout. You know what I mean? He's. he's I thought he's, he was he's, a corner the first time I started watching some of the film. I saw him on YouTube do a pick six well, against somebody, and I was just like. Man, he's a little guy. 
Yeah, well, he's he, 5'10", 214. That's right. pretty damn small. But he's – but uh, but I, I mean, he pa- like I said, man, he packs a punch, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, you go watch the games and you see, like, he's – he, he he's a he's a big he's a big time hitter, dude. Like he, he's a he's a good player. He's a good player. He knows what he's doing. He's a leader of that defense. He's the heartbeat of that defense. It's one of the better defenses in all of FCS, right? And he's the absolute undeniable heartbeat. He's right there in the thick middle of it. He can put, play anywhere. My question is, just like uh, I mean, I, I I think that what you guys are saying and what they're saying in chat is is probably right. It's like. What, what are we even saying? How does he fit into the defense? It's like I said in my column. What what defense? <laughs> the miserable, like as if you have this recipe dialed up perfectly. As if as if it's like nah, that's fair. Man, this like like this guy's gonna come in and screw up all this great stuff we have going on. Like giving up fifty five <laughs> points to Kansas at home. You know, like it's like the defense is the defense has no identity anyway. Do you, you know, know who I think this player. guy could play for Alex? Who? Gary Patterson. This feels yeah. like the kind of guy that we would see at a TCU and you'd say, how the hell did they find this guy? He was a running back in East Texas and now he's playing linebacker and, you know, now he's an all big 12 type of a player. Yeah. I think, I think something that you just said is really important. What defense, if you start to, instead of trying to fit this guy into, you know, a square peg into a round hole, what if there are just no pegs or holes and you just have guys and you're trying to build the best thing you can build based on the talent you have available at that point, you can probably make it. If he's suddenly, even if you don't know what to exactly what to do with him, if he's one of your better guys, you figure it out, right? Yeah, What's I mean, the downfall of bringing him in? I mean, there's none. He's a one year guy. I mean, if he, if he makes no doubt, I, I don't it's think that there's any, I mean, the conclusion I came to is that there isn't there there isn't any downside, but it, it's and, and with Texas, it's a beggars can't be choosers kinds of situation. You have a guy that brings a lot of good traits. Is it a perfect fit for? Exa- I mean, would you like him to be two thirty five and six feet tall and have him fit in perfectly into that? Check all those boxes for like your Mike linebacker come in and really push a Jalen Ford. But you because you could picture you don't have to squint as hard to picture it if that were the case. But it's like he's a he's a really good player. Like it really doesn't take much. You don't even have to put on highlights. Just just put on a quarterfinal FCS championship level game at that level, and just watch number two, and just uh, like sit back and enjoy the show. He's really, really, really good. And so, uh, I mean, do, do, well, does we that translate can't say that about many linebackers on the right. Texas roster? Does that translate to Texas and the Big Twelve? Who knows? But I mean, what at this point with with all the depth issues and everything else? What do you have to lose? And it's not like you're trying to fit any kind of square peg into any round hole. Like what I'm saying is the round holes don't exist to put the square pegs yeah. into. That, like so, I, I couldn't I, agree I, more than what Mark and Paul just said. Speed and instincts are much more important than measurables at linebacker. Uh, give me. I've always said like even when uh, you know when Texas had was it Harris the middle linebacker catch their of their national championship game right? Yep. I always said you know what he's. He's not a guy that's ever going to walk through the doors at a combine or anything else and blame it, but he was just a good football player, man. Just give me – sometimes we get too hung up on measurables. Just give me a guy that's just a good football player. This dude's a good football player. He's ultra athletic. I'm not worried about him being 5'10", 214. I mean, if he can play in space and shed blocks, bring him in. And like, and then Paul said something about he could play linebacker, spur, and even safety with Gary Patterson. Patterson's the Belichick of college football. Exactly, man. Bring him in and you get creative with him and – well, I wonder if they can do something different with Overshone. If this guy, if this guy came in and in August is your first or second best linebacker on the team, then I just wonder if, if you know, instead of trying to think about how he fits in around other guys, if he's good Jeez. enough, you figure out how you can make other guys fit around him. This is a Texas defense that's got question marks everywhere. They got to get good football players on the field. Period. And the problem that Texas had defensively last year, they didn't have enough good football players. And they, they certainly didn't have enough good football players at linebacker because how many times did we see, you know, Texas? Kennedy Brooks, yeah, Jalen Warren. Just gashed in the running number, game. So. Number, number 28 for two different Oklahoma teams. I can picture it both in my head right at the second <laughs> level. <laughs> oh, uh, Anwar. Back to the th- – what was the thing? It's It feels like so long ago. <laughs> what was the thing we were going to talk about before we went into – The kickoff. The, the kickoff. 
the oh, uh, that's Texas, right, uh, Alabama that Steve Sarkeesian uh, decided to comment on. You know this this week, and you know the what looks like probably be you know 11 a.m. kickoff, and Steve Sarkeesian in Houston uh, saying he doesn't give a shit what time the kickoff is. I'll be ready. Um, they fired up Steve Sarkeesian at the touchdown club in Houston, by the way. Um, gotta, you know, I think when we think primetime games, I think our mind always reverts to nighttime as what is viewed as primetime. The thing is, is that when it comes to TV, a lot of them, they view the afternoon game, especially that big noon at 11 o'clock one as really the primetime game. They view that's how they, they go about it. So I know in our minds, we think. Monday night football that that's that's prime time. And of course, when we think about uh, the playoffs, uh, you know, those are always evening games. But during the season, uh, the 11 a.m. kickoff is really, you know, that's that's money, you know, for, for the networks. And that's where they feel like they have the biggest audience. So, um, yeah, it's more than likely it's going to be a hot day. It's going to be Texas, Alabama. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we no one can control that. It, it, it'll have to be 11 a.m. And uh, it's yeah. I mean, hell, I remember catch. Texas LSU being a late game, and it still was hot. I mean, it wasn't like it got it they dropped, say- dropped, <laughs> dropped down in the seventies that night. It was just beautiful. Like it they're, they're, saying, they're saying in the chat that the farmer's almanac says it's going to be hot. That day. <laughs> hey, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't need a farmer's almanac to tell you it's going to be hot on that day in, the, in Austin, Texas, man. It's going to be hot. I, I can tell you that without checking a damn thing. Let me tell you what it's about on war though. It's about a lot of old people come and sit on like, you know, the West side of the stadium on game days. Mm-hmm. And when it's that hot and it, like, that's just about people not wanting to stroke out in the stadium, but it does it, you know, if you're Texas, I always have thought that the Texas heat is an advantage. Texas is the one that has to work out in the Texas heat. And, you know, I mean, it's a Saturday almost in August, not that far away from August. It's gonna be a hundred degrees in the daytime, just about everywhere. And on so, the field, ten degrees hotter. On the field, it's like ten degrees hotter. If you look oh at man, I remember when they played Colorado in 1994. I had to wear. It's the only time I ever wore a suit to a Texas oh, football game because mm. I was the, I was a 17 year old high school student and like right. you know I was trying to make a good impression, so I had my cheap Sears suit on and. It was 140 degrees on the field. Oh, God. Because that was back when they had the AstroTurf. That's hotter than my infrared sauna, dude. And (laughs) I've never been so happy to get the call that I could come and watch the rest of the game in the press box. (laughs) There were two of us. There were two of us. It's 50-50. And somebody had to stay down and give injury updates on a telephone back up to the press box. And the other person got to sit up in the air conditioning and no longer sweat through their suit. So, you know, I've, I've been on that field when it's as hot as it can possibly be. I think we just, if it's, I kind of like Sarkeesian's attitude about it because in kind of complaining about it, it somewhat plants a seed for an excuse. And I did like that Sark essentially said, we're, I, our motto is just put the ball down and let's go. That's where the team and the players need to be. And, you know, us hey, fans man, yeah. complaining he, he, about kickoff times. I mean, you know, it, it just is makes it, is. it seem soft. It makes it makes it seem, you know, when it when the whole shed the country club image, it's it, it reeks of love it. It's gonna be really warm out there today. Oh, you're gonna bring a fine and my tea. Like it, it just stop there. Don't be thirsting to howl the third. You know, when it comes to Texas, <laughs> Alabama, you know, the old school. And I don't know if uh, Alex has any clue what I just referenced, but I didn't know that Gilligan's Island. Island. Come Come on. On. Hey, he, he doesn't. He uh, do you know Thurston Howell British. the third is? Alex, I do. Well, do. Do you know what? I'm sorry, as well as reading Thurston this Howell. Do you know who he is? I think so. I just, uh, <laughs> I told- you're, you're putting me way too on the spot. I'm not sure. I so the guy know. that made the Ram Man reference doesn't know who Thurston Howell the Third is. He doesn't. You forget how young he is sometimes, man. He's still young. Thurston Howell. So, so it's um. Googling it. That's cheating. I can tell you're googling. Oh no! We I, can I see don't your know screen this is. brighten up, Alex. <laughs> no, I don't know who this is. I'm sorry. It's the millionaire from the Gilligan's Island. 
Yeah. Which, whether you know it or not, I guarantee you half the people in the chat right now watching the video have no idea. We are old. God damn it. Yes. We just, onward, you made a Gilligan's Island reference, and it's sinking in right now that Jason and I got that. <laughs> half of the people in the crickets, they're just We watched it the on the first run, Kits. We watched the original run of it probably. Yes. I don't <laughs> You still don't. We just still don't know if Alex know has ever really watched Gilligan's Island. Like someone's gonna bet he knows Marianne or Ginger. Well, no, <laughs> you I, may not. I had to do, I had to do a ten thoughts from the weekend for catch one time, and somebody asked me in chat if I liked Marianne or Ginger, and I didn't know who it was, so I wow. actually I actually went and looked them both oh, up. Shit. I gave I gave my answer. Well, who was your answer? I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. I, 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 I had strong birthday. thoughts about one of them. I had strong thoughts about one of them. Yes, I, I Nate's takes. That birthday. reference was on color TV. <laughs> <laughs> barely, barely, but it was. Uh, hey, yes, before we transition, I was just looking because we were talking about schedules. Alabama and A&M is the same day as Texas OU. So hopefully they the networks find a way to stagger those games, right? And oh. if I'm a oh that Alabama A and M game's prime time, no prime doubt time. about it. And if I'm a, if I'm like going to Vegas, like I wish I'd have known this stuff. I'm betting the house on the week before A and M. Alabama plays at Arkansas. The week after A and M, they're at Tennessee. I'm betting the house on Arkansas and Tennessee plus the points because you know. That's a classic trap letdown game, right? Before and after that AM game. So uh interesting little scheduling quirks there for the first three weeks of October. Real quick on war, I want to go back to the Saban and it, in a weird way, I feel like we watched a couple of wrestling promos get cut. If 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 this were boxing. We would have just looked at the boxers and say, okay, well, they just did that to, to sell some pay-per-views, right? Mm -hmm. Saban cuts a promo, bashing a and Then the next day, I mean, some of these quotes from uh, Fisher are wild. Essentially that Nick Saban needs to be slapped in the face and that um, – you know, the whole God and walking on water, but if people look at dig, it, look into his past, they'll find things they don't want to find. I feel like this weirdly elevates a and like, Maybe it's not a big thing, but Fisher, I mean, Saban doing this puts a and in a spotlight in a way that that program is forever begging to be in the spotlight it's actually a good look for AM and it's a good look for jimbo fisher and it's like here 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 where we are taking up a and side you know <laughs> like a, a whole, jimbo, like a whole chat full of texas fans are like hell yeah jimbo it's like jimbo it's fisher gets to walk around on war yeah. for the next couple of months and recruiting and say we're the program that nick saban stays up at night worried about and yeah. in a very weird yeah. way, it feels like he elevated A and M a little bit. He's, he's it looked like it, it looks like he's scared. That's what it looks like. It looks like he's scared of of what's going on. And what what did you guys see? Somebody said that never forget. Such is still repping his home phone in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Like, this, technically, this, can have, this, this can also function as a fax machine, by the way. It's not just a printer. It can be a Jason, fax machine. Jason's still using his AOL dial-up disk to get on the internet. <laughs> so, um, That's how we yeah. chatted before Slack. Yeah, yeah, that and, or, or Prodigy. Like, I don't know which one, Jason, which one of those leftover discs he has. But, uh, yeah, I mean, no, it, 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 you acknowledge it. And by, by acknowledging and you, you show a little bit of fear, you show that you're intimidated, it, you show, once again, that you're losing power. It seems like a balance shift because that that you only worry about the programs that are a threat to you. Like, you don't, you don't, talk about the programs that you don't feel like are a threat to you. He didn't, he didn't call out anybody else. He only called out the programs that he felt like was a threat to his empire. He was, you know, it was what a and did with their, their number one recruiting class. And then Jackson state being able to get the number one uh, person in the country. That's a threat. That's what he's used to doing. And so, yeah, now Jimbo gets to walk around 
and be able to say, yeah, we're, we're, we are the new kids on the block. We will take over for what a at a and at some point. <laughs> we will take over for a and at some point. And so do you, do you want to be a part of the new generation of where college football is heading? Or do you want to be with that old stuff? You know, it, it is, it is, it's, it's like the source awards in some way catch, you know, it's like, it is like Suge Knight just coming out at some point. And, you know, do you want a guy dancing up all in the videos you know, come to death row. And that's what his demo is going to be like. Do you want to be like this guy trying to block your NIL deals, trying to make sure you don't get money, talking about the right way? Well, if you want to come and get paid and play major college football, come to a and the My other favorite thing about the press conference that Jimbo had, and this, this will be my final comment on that. We can start wrapping things up a little bit. He, the, he For him to say, like my old man taught me to never lie and to never cheat. And I'd get slapped if I did either. And maybe someone should slap. I mean, Nick Jimbo's dirty too. Like that's the irony of all of this. Like everybody's dirty. Everybody's dirty. And that's what made Nick Saban calling it out. So funny that it, it feels like two of the dirtier guys in college football over the course of, of the last two decades having a slap fight about something that they should probably just keep to themselves. And I don't know. Anwar, you said you got one more topic you wanted to yeah, jump to, into? To, 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 to Jimbo's defense, he was called out. So at that mm-hmm. point, even though I, it, it, he's got to respond at that point. So Really, I think Saban's the one that looks kind of like, you know, like the B in, in this whole well, I'm just saying Jimbo's dirty too, though. Like Jimbo specifically said today, he doesn't lie and he doesn't cheat. Dude, you're a major college football coach. Common, and you've worked common. at Florida State and, and, and Texas A&M. You do both. Two of the dirtiest coaches, if you said, hey, pick two of the dirtiest coaches who bend the rules the most – they'd probably be one and one A for so for either one of them to get on their high horse and act like they're innocent and they don't lie and they don't cheat is it's just comical. But I mean, Jason, you might be used the word allegedly, by the way, allegedly, just, allegedly on thank okay, you very much. I just, uh, I'm just trying to prevent you from appreciate the law. that. Yes. Um, okay. That was Alex Dunlap talking by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see this whole blow up, if you're talking about any two coaches in college football, I don't care if it was Vanderbilt and Wake Forest coaches having this blow up, right? But to see Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban getting in this back and forth is just makes it even more fascinating. Yeah. All right. So the only thing I wanted to kind of throw out there before we signed off catch and maybe just go quick conversation from everything I did this past week. Um, and I'll have stuff in the war room on Thursday and I've got enough uh, to kind of spread it out over the next couple of weeks. But I thought one interesting topic, um, you know, wanted to get your opinion on and even Jason's opinion on, maybe to a certain degree, Alex. But, um, you know, I asked uh, Steve Sarkeesian kind of about his recruiting philosophy as relates to quarterbacks. Um, and I thought he gave a really interesting answer, which is saying basically I, he wants to basically take one, uh, you know, each time because he said recruiting quarterbacks is kind of a, a delicate situation. Um, I think at one point, I think we started seeing like Tom trying to recruit two uh, at a time, but then there's certain years where you, you, you're waiting on the one. It seemed to be catch to me the message to Arch that we are waiting on you. We're willing to wait on you and you're our guy. Also seems a little risky business because, you know, we've always asked Jason like, hey, what's the backup plan if Arch doesn't come? And especially if you, it things to be seems to be trending the way that they are, which you know, several months ago, catch I said that there's a good possibility that Arch may announce in the fall, and everyone was like, "That's BS. No way, that's going to happen. It's going to be in the spring. You don't know what you're talking about." Yada yada. Well, we're about to approach into June, and we don't seem any closer to a decision. So, I, you know, that was a very interesting thing, and I just want to kind of throw it out on the floor to see what everybody else thought when they heard that going forward, it's it's going to be maybe one QB a year. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was so clear he was specifically talking about Arch, which he didn't mention Arch because he can't, of course. But, you know, I saw your tweet, too, Anwar, and it had a big picture of Arch. I mean, it was so clear. You know, I want to say uh, hat tip to Anwar, too, because, like, people jumped your shit so much whenever you said 
hey, he may like wait until the fall or who knows, maybe even like close to December before deciding because he wants to see how things play out. Everybody who thought you were or called you crazy and you're wrong and your sources were shit. And you know what, man? Your sourcing on Arch have been spot on. So uh, <laughs> tip tip of the cap to you, Anwar. But um, yeah, I, you know, it, I think it's interesting. I mean, you, with the with the way with the transfer portal, I don't think there's any set rules. I mean, ideally, yeah, you take one every year and you just kind of keep that thing rolling every year. But there might be some years, and and I know this year the plan is to take one. And he was specifically talking about Arch Manning. But who's to say next year, man? If if Hudson Card transfers and you don't get arch um then Malik probably- would be the wild card too like Malik, he's a key I mean, part of the, the quarterback numbers yeah, game I mean, at this point but you might take two quarterbacks next year so in a perfect world yes i think you're taking one every year but i think that's it certainly has some moving parts in it especially uh with the transfer portal yeah on where i thought that there's a part of me that was like, no, yeah, duh, you're going to take the, in a perfect world. You just take one quarterback every year. And it's kind of the why it's such a game of musical chairs and recruiting, right? Like when we watched mm-hmm. Kate Klubnick a year ago, all of the quarterback spots were kind of filling up and it was like, what's he going to do? And then he picks Clemson and he gets Clemson spot. And that, you know, for, for schools that don't have numbers problems at quarterback, you usually the goal is to take one. I think the, the biggest thing that came out of that was like the overt messaging to Arch and its implications specifically with Arch, which was we're going to wait as long as it takes. He referenced his offensive line comments from a year ago. Uh, and to the victor go the spoils, right? Because they end up signing this monumental offensive line class you know, we I think we sound like little bitches sometimes when we say, well, they got a little lucky there and it took mm-hmm. a coach leaving and doing this and the pancake factory, you know, all these things kind of came together at once that helped them out there. But like in the end, Sark got his guys and it was exactly what he said when he was asked about it during the season, which is you know, I can go out and get anybody I want that's, you know, below the guys that we want, but there's one group of guys that we want. There's one quarterback that we want, and we won't budge off of that. I think that from a practicality standpoint, it's not a good year in the state of Texas at the quarterback position. So I wonder what it looks like if they don't get Arch. I mean, Jason, you tell me. There's not an obvious – you remember when they missed on Rhett Bomar, and it was like, okay, well, now – go offer Kirby Freeman and go offer Graham Harrell. And there were all these guys that year that were next in the totem pole. And some were offended that Texas was only going in after they off, you know, after they lost their guy, but there's not like a long list of players this year. So what may actually happen on war is that I wonder if Texas gets a quarterback and that was the thing that crossed my mind. Will they even sign a quarterback in this class if they don't get arch because if they don't get Arch the way that it might unfold, it might just be kind of a body. And they're recruiting that position at such a level that unless they have a plethora of uh, departures, right? Malik leaves, Hudson leaves. Suddenly it's like, well, what's our depth look like? And you've got, I, I just, I think the portal is the saving grace now for all of these schools. So, I think if Arch goes somewhere else other than Texas, what you might see is Texas wait to see what happens in the portal at the quarterback position and that the at the guy in that class might just be someone who's not a high school prospect. But really interesting that he was so willing to, you know, basically speak to the Mannings with the answer to that question. Like Jason said, without ever having to say his name, we knew what he was saying. Um, and it did seem to be a very public, we love you and we're just going to wait for you and you do what you got to do. And if and when we get to a moment where we got to do something else and we can do something else, but we're not flinching off of our number one target. Yeah, he's, he's, asked, the, he's asked the head cheerleader to prom. It's not asking anybody else until she gives a decision. And so he asked, they asked her at, at the beginning of the school year, 
And they're going to wait all the way to the fall to see what happens. Anybody want to jump into parting shots? We're creeping up towards 11 o'clock. We've been going for almost an hour and a half. Anybody want to lead us off? I got one. Go for it. Shout out catch to our guy, Scott Smith, at Del Frisco's in Houston at the Galleria Mall. Catch and I went there on Tuesday, and it is some of the best food I've had. You know, I called out the steakhouses here uh, in Austin, and then t- t- I you pulled it I, out. Yeah, and I, as in a guy that laughed at Alex for so long about just being unashamed to get on here and beg and plead. <laughs> and I laughed. I, mo- I literally, I mocked him. I thought Alex was a kook for doing what he did. And all I know is every time Alex wants to go out hunting on someone's damn land, all I know is he closes the door behind him and doesn't let anything out. And Alex gets to do that. And so I, I called out the steakhouses and Scott Smith from Del Frisco's in Houston invited us out there, invited me out there. So Ketch and I go out there. Some of the best damn food I've had in a long effing time. Free. He's leaving the part out, Alex. Free. <laughs> Free food is always the best tasting food. And, yeah. like, I'm still full, on war. It's Thursday. I'm still full. What kind it of is. steak does y'all have? I got to know. Yeah, I mean, we got to – come on. Did you guys get some – did you guys well, get steaks? Or it started steak? off with fried lobster as an appetizer. Are you serious or is that oh, a joke? Oh, so no, good. Serious. You got to look at my Twitter. I'll show it to you. And oh, then God. there were these little egg rolls, like with filet mignon in the egg rolls that I didn't really get into. And then the steaks came out and there was a little uh, – the ribeye was fantastic. Mm. I'm not – I'm typically – I would just – Go straight for the filet whenever I go to a steakhouse and just, you know, that's kind of where I stick. But we had this, uh, the ribeye, and then uh, I think it was a sirloin. Like they brought out two and had them like sliced up into what it would look like if you were making a fajita, the little mm. strips already cut, pre cut for you. And then there were just countless sides, the desserts. He brought out like five desserts. It was, it was awesome. It was mm. awesome. And I normally go out of my way to eat so much steak that I never d- eat, do dessert. Yeah, man, I killed that chocolate mousse, though. It was legitimate. So <laughs> yeah, Arwar, I've hungry. already told Heather that we're going to Del Frisco's. Like, yeah. Scott won me over for sure. A- a- Alex, check your Slack channel. Right. And, and, and then you, as a guy who's like a tequila fan, they, they made this old-fashioned um, with tequila – it's like the best oh, old fashioned wow. I've had, Look at man. That. Look at some of these photos. I wish we could do a screen share here. Jesus, man, you guys ate good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, shout, shout out to my man Scott. And uh, by the way, I'll be heading down to uh, Miami uh, in a couple of weeks. So, if you got some same kind of hookups uh, down in <laughs> the area, uh, first weekend of June, I'll be down in Miami. So. If you got a nice restaurant that you want me to uh, enjoy, you got a boat, a uh, yacht, whatever the case may be, um, I will be in South Beach uh, first weekend of June for a few days. Um, I can bring, I can even bring one of my Hall of Fame friends and, and party with you. But if you just want to hang out with me, uh, hit me up at uh, in, in my email address nflonwar at yahoo uh, dot com. That's nflonwar at yahoo dot com. Uh, I'm pretty sure Anwar just said if anybody out there lives in Miami and wants to pay for a steak dinner for him, yes. he'll let you hang out with Warren Sapp. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that's what he just said. That, that's basically the offer. That's basically the offer. <laughs> if if you can make it happen on South Beach. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> uh, Alex, do you want to follow that up? No, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have much, man. Like, honestly, if I, if I mean, I don't have a parting shot. You guys know I, I did go hunting last week. I had, I, it was the most tilting hunting trip I've ever, ever been on. And if I got on the rant about that, we'd be here for another 10 or 15 minutes. So I don't want to get on to you, it. Man, did you not get anything? No, but I, but, but I, but I would have if I wasn't such a wuss and such a, such a coward and so just so. If I was a little tougher, like I would have, I would have had a 246 pound just pig of an axis deer, but I gave up. Um, I did everything that I know I shouldn't have done, and I gave you up had on the feelings hunt. for the deer. 
No, I, I gave up on the hunt. Ba basically, ba basically what, what happened was I got put on this, I got put on this part of the land where they had cows. Right. And it's, it was out kind of West, kind of West here, Fort Makovit, uh, Minard area there, like junction, all those spots, lots of free range access out there. But this field I was in had, had cows and there is terrible drought out there. Right. And so the, the field was completely overgrazed. And so what I had done, like the cat, like what I'd done is they didn't have blinds set up out there. They, the, the, the feeders weren't set up. So I just set up a couple of blinds in a couple of spots where I thought it looked really good, you know, game trails, crossing areas and stuff like this. But I didn't, there wasn't anything to really attract to the, the axis in. And so I just, I, I, I just went and got a bunch of bales of alfalfa and I just, I took my ATV and I was just shaking it all around the hunting area, just trying to get the smell of alfalfa in that hunting area. Well, these cows with that, with as overgrazed as everything was, um started to smell the alfalfa and they would just come to come and eat it all up and so i got so tilted by these cows i put up with them for one night i woke up the next morning when i got there the next morning i was gonna go put out some more alfalfa get all this stuff set up and the cows are waiting at the goddamn gate for me they could hear my they could hear my atv and they were waiting at the gate they, <laughs> they started being like aggressive and all this because they didn't have anything else to eat you know like the fields were all over grazed, and so everywhere i go man like the deer don't come to where the cows are Right. So anywhere I would have gone, the cows would have would have would have followed. Right. So I did this thing where I said, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this alfalfa. I'm going to take it way to the other side of the property. I'm going to waste 60 bucks worth of alfalfa, just putting it all out around here to keep the cows over here. I'm going to go back to my blind over on this side. Right. And then we'll see. We'll see what happens. I got all the cows over there. I go back to my blind. There's still this one damn cow that's standing in the middle of that in the middle of that patch. I knew that nothing was going to come as long as that cow and her little calf were right there. So I'm just like, screw this. These cows, as soon as these cows are done eating this food, they're going to come right back here anyway because they see the ATV, they associate it with the food. Like, I'm like, I'm done. I'm 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 headed home. Um, a guy a guy walks in there at 5:30 p.m. into the ground blind I had set up over that thing. The cows were on the other side. A 246 pound pig of an axis walks out in front. He takes it down because I, I just fed the crap out of the area. Free range, beautiful axes. They made sure to send me photos. Um, <laughs> they rubbed it in your face. They rubbed it in his face because wow. I gave I gave up I, I gave up on it. I just I, I gave up. I said, "There's no way." You know, there's there's no way. It's just such a tilting lesson. Um, but it makes me realize, like, I'm never going home early on a hunt again. When things get hard, I just need to just deal with it and just suck it up and you weakling. Like, not be such a wuss because like I came home empty handed and I can't get back out hunting again until I, I'm, I'm like, I'm out of deer meat almost. I can't get back out hunting again until the end of August, right before I'm going to go out right before the September 3rd game. Cause that'll be the last time I have any time before the season starts. And we just, I'm, 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 I'm going to be snowed under. So I will say this, uh, if there's anybody out there that has access on their land and wouldn't mind letting me come by, just like I've had a, I've had a stretch of bad luck. It's like Amor says, I shut the gates behind me. I do everything that you would ever need. If you don't mind me coming up, I'll shoot an axis dough. It doesn't matter. I won't shoot any bucks in velvet. I won't even shoot any bucks, period. I'll take care of the place. I'll leave it better than I found it. If you have access on your property and you can give me access to come on there and shoot them, I would really, 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 just one, just one dough is, is, is all I'm asking. So you can reach me at, at uh, alex at rosterwatch.com or on Twitter at Alex Dunlap NFL. I would really appreciate it because I can't live with the stink of this whole situation that just happened, you know, for the whole summer. And my family's counting on me to bring home the meat. So, <laughs> oh wow, I love that you laid it on. Can I just say though, Alex, you did a good thing. You fed some cows. I, I dude, and I those cows. I swear, to, I'm I'm having nightmares about these cows. Catch all summer long. Just, They're your friend. They love you. Yeah, they yeah they love me. That's the reason why I was so frustrated. They wouldn't get away from me. So anyway. I don't know that I've heard a good first world set of problems like I just heard Alex's cow problem. And that was a pro that's a that's a primal problem. Guess I'm trying to go out and get meat. That's not a first world problem. That's like a that's a very pr primordial like it's a it's a it's an issue of my. my I've never pride. heard of a hunter complaining about cows before. Well, it's, uh, if the cows in the pasture, man, the deer won't come by. You got to get them out of there. What What do deers have against cows? They just don't like to be. I mean, you can ask anybody in the chat. There's, there's like anybody that's. <laughs> I mean, how many times? Well, do you Omar, why don't deers like cows? 
I don't think that I've never really seen them associated with each other. Um, Why the chicken cross the road question? Was <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember, you never. How often have you ever seen a picture of like a deer with a cow? Like that usually doesn't happen. All right. So I feel like I've seen deer. deers around horses though. Well, well, horses are usually you know they're 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 corralled up. They're not free ranging animals the same way that. You know, deer and cows both kind of free range and eat on the same. Yeah, you got Deer, deer, deer just don't like food. to be around them. They're also competing for food too. Well, that's the what deer, I was about to say. Like the, the the deer would be smart to hang out with cows because then it would make the shots. So, like if like if a deer was just standing right in front of a if, if it just stood right in front of the cow, no no one would ever shoot it because then you. I thought you were going to tell me you were like afraid to shoot a cow that you saw a saw a deer and you didn't pull the trigger because you were afraid of shooting a cow. No, it, like any cows are a huge nuisance. They screw everything up if, if you're out there trying to hunt. Come on, cows. Yeah. Get the hell out of the way. Leave that man's alfalfa alone. Uh, Jason, good luck. Talk yeah. Hey. Um, I'm wondering what I missed last week. Like when we first started the modcast, everybody's like, said I was being talked about and y'all were arguing about importance or credit, something and money out. Dana said parting shot. Sukumil, your recruiting prognostications were mentioned as a form of some type of weird foreplay during last week's modcast. I'm like, I had to go back. Is, is it that? wrong that I have no idea what he's talking about? I don't know. Well, I certainly don't. So, uh, oh, no, don't you remember the people in the chat were saying like, that's like, like there's no better way to get your wife turned on than the reader, than the reader, uh, Jason's recruiting updates on orange. <laughs> <Blood and stuff. laughs> I you don't, don't remember that stuff. Oh, okay. if that, but that was, a, that was a week ago. That's some brain cells. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, my parting shot on a somewhat not a somewhat a serious note. Um, I've been going to the Austin Lunch Bunch, um, mostly Orange Buds guys. But I was trying to think, man. It's been probably close to twenty years. Catch like when when I first started Orange Buds, they used to meet over off of Far West and then Mesa Ranch, and when they went to Bone Daddy's, now they meet at Saltgrass. I go there about once a month, not probably as often as I should. But um, sadly, one of the the longstanding members, uh, Rance, passed away about a month ago. So they're having a memorial for him. Uh, today at one o'clock. So I'm going to go to that. So um, rest in peace, Rance. He's a longtime Austin Lunch Bunch member, Orange Bloods member. So uh, he'll be missed. Always had a great sense of humor at the Lunch Bunch and kind of um, cut from the same cloth. He liked the dirty old man sex jokes like I do. So uh, Rance will be missed and uh, I'll be going to his memorial today. So rest in peace, Rance. My parting shot. I'm actually stealing from Dustin McComas. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Darwin. That hits a little too close to home. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Um, just to recap one little thing from the Jimbo Fisher press conference today that's not getting enough attention because of the haymakers that he threw out into the world. Somebody asked Jimbo Fisher if he was aware of how the NIL collectibles work. And he was like, no, I don't know how that works. Interesting that a head coach at this point would it would suggest out loud that they don't understand the rules and the way NIL works inside the the the, the texture of I, I guarantee you if you ask Steve Sarkeesian today, do you have a grasp of the NIL world? He wouldn't say no, I don't think. <laughs> so that Fisher is alleging that Saban is a great cheater and that, you know, uh, everybody should look into his background. And then when somebody asks, do you know how NIL works? He played dumb and said he doesn't. Just one of those things that in the future, there should probably, I can't wait for, Anwar, we might have to send you to SEC Media Day. Like, it might not be a bad way for you to spend a few days, Cause that shit's going to be wild. Uh, yeah. And it's a league that, um, Texas is easily, easily, I mean, could easily said it about Texas. It's easily justifiable. Now it's not like, Oh, why did you guys go there? You're pumping up. No, people will want it. Here's the question I want to ask everybody. The obvious answer is Lane Kiffin. So we're taking Lane Kiffin out of the equation. Who's the next sec head coach? It gets involved in this Saban Fisher thing because everybody's going to be asked about it. And I wonder who has enough guts or who's angry enough about 
just things in general that they would dare enter the fray. Anybody? Lane Kiffin's definitely going to do it. Is there anybody Kirby? else? Well, what you about Kirby? Gets yeah. into it? I say Kirby Smart to be the one to be the one that I would. You know, but he's he's going to come to Saban's defense, right? Who knows? I feel like what Kirby about, keep what his if, mouth shut. What, what about that Arkansas coach? He's kind of old and salty. <laughs> what's his name again? I forget his name. Old and salty. Uh, uh, what's his name? Pittman. Sam something. Yeah, yeah. Sam Pittman. Pittman. That's who I'd say. And Sam Pittman. Anyway, everybody, leave your comments in the comment section. Do us a solid like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you're brand new to the channel, we do this shit all the time. This is like how we roll. We talk about slaughtering animals behind cows and scoring free mills. And like, oh, we mix in some football as well. By the way, uh, Jordan Addison, if you just joined in, waiting on that decision, could be. I think either today or tomorrow, stay tuned. It feels like we're close to the finish line on that deal. Uh, for myself, Anwar, Alex, Jason, and our producer behind the scenes, Michael Rockman, who's been holding the whole thing down for us. You guys have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll see you next week. Later.